Let me just now uh, pass uh, uh, the, the floor actually to our first speaker. So let me introduce her, even if she does not need an introduction. I mean, the first speaker is Londa Schiebinger. She is the John Hinz Professor of History of Science at the History Department at Stanford University. She is also the director of uh, the EU, so the European Union and, uh, and US project Gendered Innovation, which is the theme and the topic of, uh, of her talk today. She received a PhD from Harvard University, and she has been writing an enormous amount of papers, some of which are really conceptual paper even for organizations like the United Nations. So you can see that she has been behind this bringing gender perspective into science and technology. And, uh, and, uh, and so it is really my pleasure that to introduce you and, uh, and to have you here, I mean, opening this conference. <clears throat> Today, she will talk about the Gender Innovation Project and how powerful is the combination of all these aspects for increasing the excellence in science. Thank you, Londa. Thank you, Francesca. It's been a pleasure to be here. We've had two days of meetings, and it was wonderful meeting the whole Lund community and the Genera community. And um, today, I want to explore with you gendered innovations. Gendered Innovations was produced through a large international collaboration involving the European Commission, the US National Science Foundation, and Stanford University. And we've now expanded globally into South Africa, Latin America, Taiwan, Korea, Japan. Since 2009, we've brought together over 220 basic scientists, engineers, and gender experts in a series of workshops. And our website has been used by 2.5 million unique users across 185 countries. And I'd like to, there are some countries I don't even know the name of that I would like to meet the people who are doing gendered innovations there. And as you know, new policies have been implemented in the European Union, Canada, and the US. And we've also expanded into Silicon Valley. Now, Silicon Valley is like, 20 minutes from Stanford, 10 minutes if they're in Menlo Park. And the funny thing, it's really a foreign country many times for sex and gender analysis. Apple makes big mistakes. Face, well, I won't even talk about Facebook. So anyway, we have been holding tech roundtables for industry leaders such as Google, Facebook, and the like. So industry, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> innovation is about integrating sex, gender, and intersectional analysis into the design of research, exactly what Mary Lou was talking about. Thank you, Mary Lou. <laughs> I am so excited. The operative question is, how can we harness the creative power of sex, gender, and intersectional analysis for discovery? Does, do these approaches add valuable dimensions to research? Do they take research in new directions? So first, I want to start with a bit of background to get us all on the same page. Governments and universities in the US and Western Europe have taken three strategic approaches <clears throat> to gender equality over the past several decades. The first I call Fix the Numbers, which focuses on increasing the numbers of women and underrepresented groups in science and engineering. The second is fix the institutions, and this is what we talked a lot about in the last two days in our Genera group. Fix the institution promotes gender equality in careers through structural change in research organizations. And the third is fix the knowledge or gendered innovations, which stimulates excellence in science and technology by integrating sex, gender, and intersectional analysis into research. Now, we distinguish these three things analytically, but of course they all work together. And I wanted to give you a couple of the pieces of evidence of how they work together. And I know Matthias Nielsen was invited today, but can't be here, so I'll channel him a little bit. He's a very large Dane, but nonetheless, I will channel him <laughs> to the extent that I can. So, Using a sample of 1.5 million medical research papers, our study, so you can find the gender of the author 
you know if they're men or women, and that's it. You can only do binary gender. I mean, it's a real failing, but anyway, that's a new research project to come up. But um, so looking at 1.5 million medical research papers, our study found a link between women's authorship and the likelihood that the study included sex and gender analysis. I think no surprise, women tend to do sex and gender analysis more than men, which is too bad because this defines excellence in science. If you're not including sex and or gender or now intersectional analysis, you're missing out on important variables and it's not complete research. So these findings show the mutual benefit of promoting both the scientific advancement of women and the integration of sex and gender analysis into research. It's kind of like the sex and gender analysis will suck the women in and the women will, do, will include these variables more in their research. Now, a second um, study I like showing the symbiosis between these three fixes is um, by Rem Kunning at uh, Harvard Business School. So we know that women file only 13% of the patents in the US. But Rem and his group figured, estimate, that if all biomedical patents filed between 1976 and 2010 had been produced equally by women and men, there would be some uh, 6,500 more female-focused biomedical inventions. It's amazing. I mean, when you go to the doctor, you always, and you're female, it's always like <laughs> they've never seen you before. It's like, Whoa, what is this? So anyway, I think this is very exciting. You get new stuff if you include, this is just the women, but they will be looking at sex and gender issues. And then I want to emphasize that, yes, I analyze this down into the three fixes, but it all works together in one system. To produce excellent science and technology, we need a systematic approach. And not only do we need to cultivate the three fixes in research teams, but the discipline here, so you need the research teams to be integrated, you need the discipline to take into account sex and gender, to promote that, the research organization must promote these things as well, and hopefully we change societies, and societies will be um, creating new priorities in science and engineering research. So that said, my short talk today focuses on the third strategic approach, fixing the knowledge. It's the newest area, and the most important for the future of science, engineering, and innovation, and this is what Gendered Innovations is all about. So how might this be relevant to your research? Many of you apply for European funds. Beginning in 2020, the European Commission, uh, the, the new Horizon Europe, strengthened the gender dimension in research requiring that applicants now are all required to integrate sex, gender, and intersectional analysis into the design of research or to justify that it's not relevant. So what's different between Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe is that now doing this is the default. That's what's required. That's what's considered good science. But if you're doing theoretical physics and it's not relevant to your work, which we could discuss, um, then you have to justify that it's not relevant to your work. Now, to support this, um, the EC held a two-year expert group, which I directed. The group consisted of 25 experts from numerous fields of uh, research, including uh, marine science, machine learning, environmental sciences, and of course, biomedicine. It's published here. This is easily found and downloaded, and a lot of the findings are also on the Gendered Innovations website. So let's dive in. Doing research wrong costs lives and money and amplifies inequalities. And we know that doing research, when we know that programs in engineering systems fail and fail more often for women and people of color. So let's zoom through some of the examples. And I'm going to mostly look at machine learning. So in Google search, men are five times more likely than women to be offered ads for high-paying jobs. Now, why is this? The algorithm has been designed to get the ad to the right person. And because the algorithm works on the data, which is on the World Wide Web, it 
understands, it sees, well, algorithms can't understand, but it understands that men make more than women. In the US, women still, as an undifferentiated group, make only 80% of what men make. So, if the ad is to get to the right person, that is to say the person who earns a high wage, then that ad should go to men, and in fact, it does go to men more often than to women. So, that's one example. Now, if we look at word embedding, any linguists in the audience? I love word embedding. <laughs> I did a lot of linguistics as an undergraduate. So word embedding, uh, which is a popular algorithm used to process and analyze large amounts of natural language data, characterizes European-American names as pleasant and African-American names as unpleasant. And again, it's seeing the human biases in the data so that um, word embedding looks at the relationship of words in vector space, and you see the closeness of different words, and pleasant words are closer to people with American-European names, and unpleasant words are more related to people with African-American names. Very interesting field of study. Now let's go to computer vision. In computer vision, um, again, we have a database which is guiding us. So here on this side, can you see my little, yes. Here you see a traditional um, US bride dressed in white, and the images will be correctly labeled bride, dress, woman, wedding. But the photograph of the North Indian bride here is incorrectly labeled performance art, red, costume. And why is this? Because 45% of the images in ImageNet, which is driving this computer vision comes from the US, even though we're only 4% of the global population. So again, it's the database. Now this can be fixed, it's not just the World Wide Web, so this can be fixed, but it must be fixed because we are not representing geographic locations um, correctly. And now here's a really fun one, and I wish I had time to show you the little video which went viral. Soap dispensers don't work for people with darker hands, with darker skin. So there was this video <laughs> that went viral. So there are two men in a restroom, and the white guy puts his hands out to get soap, and boom, he gets soap. And so then the guy with darker skin puts his hands out to get soap, and he gets nothing. So the white guy, boom, soap. The guy with darker skin, no soap. So <laughs> now, why is this? <laughs> it's because there is a near-infrared technology to see the hand, close the loop, and dispense the soap. And because melanin in the skin in interferes with this light, it doesn't work for people with, darker, with different tones of skin. Now, this was very serious during the pandemic because pulse oximeters, which are, were the first technology in the emergency room, were not working for people with darker skin. And this is very serious because with the early COVID, you really had trouble breathing, and if your oxygen saturation falls below 88%, you need supplemental oxygen. And when the pulse oximeter isn't reading that correctly, it always reads people with darker skin as higher, having higher oxygen saturation, then they're not getting the oxygen they need. And in the US, there's an added problem that the insurance company won't pay for supplemental oxygen if you don't get a reading of 88%. So even if a physician had figured this out in the course of the pandemic, you would be very upset in the US if you were not covered by insurance when you're in the emergency room. So uh, that wouldn't really be good. So there are lots of things, you know, heart rate monitors, a lot of these Fitbits and Apple Watch and things don't work for people with darker skin, and in some cases, this can have very serious consequences. And so, one more example from mechanical engineering, and that is um, in automotive crashes, we know that belt-restrained women are 47 times more likely than belt-restrained men to be injured in a car accident after controlling for weight and body mass. So, basic message, don't get into a car if you're not a mid-sized male. And we all know that this is because of the crash dummies um, 
and the crash dummies have taken the mid-sized male, even still here in Sweden, you have the leader, you have um, Astra Linder, who is the leader in crash test dummies, and she has created a 50th percent, I think it's still virtual, female crash test dummy, and our national government won't use it. I don't think it's been mainstreamed here in Sweden either. The technology is there, we know how to do it. It's not just the height and weight, of the men and women, it's that women have different muscle strength, different ligament strength, uh, different spinal alignments, that sort of thing. We aren't, you don't just pink and shrink the male crash test dummy and get a female. You have to actually model the female body. Now, each of these examples is important, but what did you notice about each of them? Each example focuses on only one social dimension either sex in the automobile crashes, gender in the Google search, race with the soap dispensers, or ethnicity with the word embedding. So this is why we have to focus um, on, on a higher level, and that is on intersectionality. Now, I don't have time today to look at how sex and sex interacts. That's a very interesting problem. I don't have time to look at how sex and gender interact. If we're taking those two, I want to look at and focus on intersectional analysis. So what do we mean by intersectionality? Intersectionality describes overlapping or intersecting forms of discrimination related to all of these factors, to gender, to disabilities, to ethnicity, to sexu sexuality, to geographic location, as I showed with the brides, to socioeconomic status. You can add more and more here. The term was coined in 1989 by legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw to describe how multiple forms of discrimination intersect specifically in black women's lives. Intersectionality was developed and is still very much a part of the black women, black feminist movement. So in 1989, Kimberly Crenshaw was concerned that the white feminist movement was excluding women of color. So, which is, you know, was the case. So let me show how this works in research on facial recognition done by Joy Bulamwini, Bulamwini at MIT called Gender Shades. And again, you should look up, she has a five minute video explaining the gender shades um, project, and you should look it up. I just don't have time to show a five minute video right now. But it's really interesting because she's developing this facial recognition technology, and that technology cannot see her face because she's female and because she has darker skin. So, the facial recognition, the intersectional analysis is that the gender analysis shows us that systems perform better on men's faces than on women's faces. The race analysis shows us that systems perform better on lighter skin than on darker skin. But the intersectional analysis then shows us that the system performed worst for black women. The error rates were 35%, really rotten technology, for darker skinned women. As you move along, for darker-skinned men, it was, the error rate was 12%. For lighter-skinned women, 7%. And for lighter-skinned men, of course, almost no rare error rate at all, only 1%. Now, there's more, of course, because you can do a sexuality analysis. And the systems often can't recognize transgender faces, especially during the transition, if someone is transitioning, because the, uh, if you're taking hormones, it can change the shape of your face, and it may not work as well. Then <coughs> there's another gender analysis, which I'm especially fond of. If you're wearing makeup, the accuracy of facial recognition systems can be reduced by 76%. This has very large implications if you're going through international borders, which now more and more use facial recognition, because, you know, after... It's going to be 14 hours for me to fly back to California. I may not, just may not have my passport makeup on when I arrive in San Francisco, you know, 14 hours later. So anyway, um, that's just kind of fun. So here we see the intersectional innovation. This is from Bulamwimi and um, Timit Gebru. So in order to fix 
the facial recognition system that uh, Joy Bolomini was working with, she created a new data set. You're getting the idea that for these automated systems, it's mostly in the data set. So they um, created a data set with members of parliament. So these are all public faces, and they could show them. Um, and it included the faces of, whoops, of men and women of darker and lighter skin drawn from members of parliament from six countries, three from Africa and three from Europe. But what problem do you see here? My students got this right away. Okay, now the data set is representative for black and white differences, but what about Asian? Stanford has, you know, we're overrun with Asian students. I mean, they're our, our best and most wonderful students, Asian students. There are no indigenous peoples shown here from the Americas or from Australia. Um, so there might be error rates for them. We don't have any non-binary people, at least that we know, that we see here. We don't know if the people are transgender. So uh, yes, this is a fix. Yes, you will get, in fact, they then, uh, took their solution to IBM and to a number of the companies they were working with, and people increased their, their accuracy, but there are still problems. You need fully representative data sets. So let me add, getting the data right and making the technology see everyone is one aspect of the problem for facial recognition. But there are larger issues of security, as I know you are aware of, Transgender people, for example, may not want to be tracked by facial recognition systems at all. And the potential misuse of facial recognition has led to uh, Belgium outlawed the use of facial recognition in public spaces completely. San Francisco police won't use it because it most often makes errors for people with darker skin. So there, there are a lot of reasons why just making the technology work isn't the final solution. You need to look at the political and ethical issues involved. So um, now we have new tools for intersectional design. Intersectionality has moved beyond just race and gender, and now there's a lot that has to do with disabilities and age and family configuration. And what haven't I said here? We always add sustainability. Um, there are many more factors like uh, migration status that you could include. And uh, we have a new tool. It's a pack of cards. It's all online, and you can just get it online, but it works so much better in person. These, uh, these are intersectional design cards. I teach a class in Stanford's design school, and we want to make sure it's for product designers. But I'd be curious to see if it works in science labs, just to get the concepts out there. So we want to make sure that when Google and, and Facebook and Apple are creating products, that it's going to work for people all across society. So we have 12 intersectional factors that you see here. Um, it's a deck of cards. And you throw those out on the table, and you see which ones might be relevant to what you are producing, your service, your product, your infrastructure. And then um, we have four levels of design with questions um, that would guide you to understand more about how do you take intersectionality into account when you're designing um, things for people. OK, so intersectional design can be critical to the interpretation, the uh, validation, the reproducibility, and generalizability of research findings. Now, I want to give you a quick tour of the Gendered Innovations website. This is so much easier when it's not on Zoom. It's really a pleasure. So these are all the tools. So Mary Lou, you were talking about, well, how do we do it? What are the tools? So since 2009, we have been making tools, methods, and case studies for um, medicine, basic science, medicine, engineering, and environmental studies. So let me just show you a little bit because this is open, available to the public. You can use them in classes, uh, however it might work for you. So let's say we wanted to study gender. So a lot of people, I think Mary Lou was kind of suggesting this, a lot of people think, well, if I'm doing sex and gender, it's just sort of one thing. Often it's interpreted as adding, using both males and female subjects in your research. 
Well, I've read plenty of research papers that had equal numbers of males and females, and then the data wasn't analyzed at all. So what we have done here, we want to show that analyzing gender is part of the entire research process. So when you're identifying the problem, can you identify a problem where gender is important and then identify the gender aspects important to that problem, which will help you narrow things down. And we here give the latest uh, literature and some tips with links, and here's the literature of uh, what's important when you're doing that. Then how are you designing your research? How do you, do you design the gender analysis in? How do you collect your data? Very important. How do you analyze the data and how, you, how do you disseminate your results? So we have, um, we have, I don't know, 12 or 13 methods here. We have one for sex and gender interact, one for intersectional approaches. I'll let you read those yourself. And then we have some specific methods. These are general, they should apply to most research. Specific methods um, for, we did one for machine learning, for example, because the computer scientists now understand that they're making errors because they don't take social factors into account. And so we wanted to address them specifically. Um, you can see the other places that we have. Uh, oh, the marine science one is really marvelous. When you're studying sex in marine organisms, they have everything. We humans are so boring compared to marine organisms. They're mostly hermaphroditic. Then they are, then, f anyway, you, you have to read about it. It's really fun. <laughs> then we have our case studies here in buckets for basic science, a uh, lot for animal research, um, for health and medicine. Uh, so some of the new ones that came out of this most recent EU focus group or, or expert group was on chronic pain, where you see sex and gender intersecting in very important ways. We included um, the heart disease, we included transgender uh, individuals there and how, how that works. So we have new ones here. Engineering, well, where'd we go? Oh yes, here we go, engineering. Let's just look at these for a second. Um, this may be my favorite section. The, there was a program officer at NSF who challenged me about 15 years ago to say, you will find no examples for engineering. Well, here they are. Um, so uh, I really like the haptic touch. As we go more and more for assistive robots, like nursing robots, caring robots, or robots for autistic kids, we have to understand how those robots will not only look and behave, but how they will touch human beings. And I had no idea how complicated our human interactions are relating to touch. So there's a nice um, study in here where they compared touch in Italy, um, I think it was Russia and, and the UK. And well, you can imagine, in Italy, you're all over, you're kissing, you know, all that sort of thing. And in the UK, it's like, hello, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> so, um, we have to understand these human conventions of touch in order to make the robots effective with humans, right? We need to meet, robots need to meet humans where they, they are. So that's one of my favorite ones. I also like the gendering social robots. Um, and we're having a workshop in, in um, August where we will be looking at intersectional social robots. So that will be fun. And then we have lots of nice uh, case studies for the environment as well, which becomes more and more important for us. But now let me conclude with some next steps. In here, I take you to our policy page. So I'm interested in science infrastructure here. There are three pillars of science and engineering infrastructure, and we need to engage with, with each of them. Policy is a driver of innovation and can incentivize scientists and engineers to integrate intersectional analysis into their research. So the first pillar, and I think Anne Pepin will be speaking about the European Commission. The European Commission has really been a leader um, in this area of asking for sex and gender research in 
the sex and gender analysis in the research. So, but others have been doing that. Uh, the US NIH in 2016 requires sex analysis in all public funded research. The German, the French, and the Austrian research foundations have also launched such policies. The idea th is that to receive public funding, researchers must design research that benefits people all across society. And so, um, a colleague and I at the Wellcome Institute have just completed a global study of 22 publicly funded uh, ag research agencies, so across six continents, and we are looking at how effective their policies for sex, gender, and we called it diversity analysis because people in, say, Latin America didn't quite understand intersectional yet, which, but diversity is a well-understood word. So we looked at that. We hope the paper is in. Um, I hope that it will be accepted soon. Then a second pillar, of course, is the peer-reviewed journals. And uh, we have, you can also look at all of the peer-reviewed journals that ask you for sex and gender analysis. So all of the medical journals, really, all of the medical journals, there are tons of journals on this page. The medical journals ask for sex and gender analysis. And what I'm really excited about is the new policies that came out from Nature this month in 2020. So Nature Cancer, Nature Communications, Nature Medicine, Nature Metabolism will introduce a pilot project asking these four points from the authors. You must say in your title or abstract, this should indicate whether your findings apply to one, only one sex or gender. So if you're only doing one sex, let's say, you need to signal that in the title so that people don't think this is generalizable research. That's pretty strong, pretty interesting. The second is to describe whether sex and gender uh, analysis was considered in the study design and whether the participants you know, were, were equal. And anyway, so, and they want to know how you did your data and that sort of thing. So this is very exciting. Now, here's the challenge. We don't have any guidelines for journals in computer science that I'm aware of. We do for computer science conferences, uh, but we don't for engineering and I don't think we do for physics at all. So next time I come to Lund, I would like to be able to report, especially I think computer science is ready to go. I would think engineering could do it easily. I don't know about physics. But anyway, this is what we need to do. Now, the third pillar um, are the universities. And I will tell you, we are not doing our job. If you want to say which of these three is lagging, it is us. It is the universities. So. Um, at this workshop we're having in August, um, uh, we are doing four case studies for gendered innovations, bringing in experts. And this is not what I wanted. I want universities. And what universities can do is to integrate into technical courses the social factors. So you find this now in CS, and this was started at Harvard University. It's something called embedded ethics. The, C, the CS in ethics is for CS. Embedded ethics in CS courses. So the computer scientists realized that algorithms just released in the wild can do so much damage that they are trying to train computer scientists to understand the social issues at the same time that they're learning the technical issues. So uh, Barbara Gross, who was the chair of computer science at Harvard, she's now retired, but she masterminded this and they actually run courses. Now Stanford, we always have to do what Harvard does. Um, so we are trying to do it too. MIT is doing it. Georgia Tech um, University, uh, when the Technical University in Munich is also, do, I've read about this as well, so I'm sure people are doing it elsewhere. So um, at this conference, or this workshop I'm having in August, we want to review all of the courses that are taking this approach, and we want to set out best practices, we want to give the good syllabi, whoever's done it well, we would like to highlight that. Um, and our hope is that this can be generalized then to engineering, which desperately needs this sort of thing, and to some of the other sciences. 
and health and medicine is trying to do this. The Charité in Berlin was very good at getting sex and gender analysis into the curriculum, but they're about the only one. I can't move Stanford Medical School far enough. The Nobel Prize winners, and you can visualize who that is, say that the students need more chemistry, so there's not time for this silly sex and gender stuff. But they, they'll, they'll learn, they will come around. So anyway, that's where I want to stop this morning. We need to think across the policy, things to do. We then need in our own research to get the smartest way of doing sex, gender, and intersectional analysis because this leads to excellent science. Thank you very much.